I probably don't need to tell the audience members who happen to go to med school, although I think that this happens to be a minority at this point, of the usefulness of drugs to people. So there are a wide variety of possible pharmaceuticals that exist. All of them do a huge amount of good for the people whose treatment they're involved in. There is a time in the period and the history of every single one of these drugs where it was not approved by relevant authorities. During that time window between when a drug is like available and can be consumed by people to the end of what is often a very long period involved in the testing of this drug for safety, etc., there are, there are X number of people whose lives could either be saved or are tangibly better off as a result of taking those drugs. What we on side proposition today is debate say for certain cases we should omit the testing, not omit the testing, but allow people individually to opt into treatments that haven't undergone the full weight of testing that we would expect for normal kinds of drugs, uh, for kinds of drugs which don't offer and don't have the salient quality that they are needed by people now. For reference sake, in my speech I'll be talking about two main things. First is about why drug people in general might need or might want to opt into these kinds of treatments. And secondly, why in the case of Ebola it happens to be particularly important that we do so. So in general, we think that people aware of the risks of certain things should be able to opt into those risks, especially given the circumstances where making like, the ability to do so would make them tangibly better off. So in a circumstance where you are going to, the odds are favor you dying anyway, we favor a kind of reprisal that allows people to opt into possible risks, given that this risk may tangibly save their lives. We don't think this is meaningfully different for any other types of risks that people take on in any other spheres of life. You are allowed to go skydiving, for example, despite the fact that doing so carries risks to your personal well-being. You are able to undertake all sorts of risks in the civilized world. We don't think that, in, like any other particular case, we should restrict human freedom on the basis that sometimes that human freedom means that people will act dangerous. This happens to be a particularly important case of doing so, given that when you are debilitatingly sick, especially if you have contracted something like Ebola, that your agency matters more. Your agency to save your own life is something that we care about more than, say, your agency to go skydiving. It's absurd then to think that we would allow human freedom to try and undergo one particular kind of choice which may be dangerous but might carry benefits to you. But the choice whether to take on possibly life-saving medical treatment, given that there is no other option to uh, undertake other kinds of treatment which may help, may help you, is the kind of thing that we value on this side of the house. Importantly, we think this is an instance where human beings are like overwhelmingly rational. Right? We think that human beings, if it was just some miracle drug, no, yeah, if it was some miracle drug right, that they could take and make themselves better, every single person would do that. Given that they are now placed in this by circumstance, placed in, the circ in, these, in these positions where they have to take this and this is their only outlet to make themselves better, we think it's abhorrent that people would undertake, would be restricted to this choice of wanting to make their life better. We think that in many cases, the period involved in testing these drugs is overly cumbersomely long. But even if we accept that it isn't overly cumbersome long, that they take, you know, try and do it as quickly as possible, we still think the time lag is unacceptable. We still think people should be able to opt into choices that make themselves tangibly better off, and understanding the circumstances and the possible risks involved in that choice, opt into those risks at the same time. That's exactly the kind of thing we accept in all other men, all other aspects of society, and all other people are allowed to opt into them. Secondly, we tell you that the Ebola outbreak gives a specific context to today's debate. It tells us there are very specific reasons why this particular outbreak and this particular disease and the various medical advances that are involved in treating this, we might want to undertake. The first is there's some arbitrariness involved in the fact that we've allowed certain Americans to opt into this treatment in the first place. So we've allowed, there's an arbitrariness to not allowing the population in Africa to do it, but doctors in America who contracted it are allowed to do it. This is that line's arbitrarily drawn, which should allow people to opt into things more freely than that. Over and above this, we think that there's a large panic effect for people. There's a large panic effect involved in the fact that now you have lots of people, especially in Liberia, who don't trust the government, who think the government is possibly keeping medicine away from them. We think in these kind of circumstances, it's best not to keep medicine away from them. 
we think it's good not to facilitate the outrage of the population, to get them to trust their government, to do absolutely everything possible in order to make their lives better off. It's better in those circumstances that they're able to opt into these risks and keep offer this medicine to as many people as possible. At least they're trying to do something to help this population, and people are unable to meaningfully engage with that, and able to meaningfully consent to that in their own way. For all of those reasons, very proud of the so I'm going to tell you a couple of things, and in particular I'm going to look at the interests of all the people that are actually involved in a vote. And I'm actually going to address a voter rather than just this nebulous kind of disease. A vote is a specific disease and it has very specific votonomics about it that are quite important. So firstly, let's talk about the main problem that James hinted at but didn't necessarily tell us explicitly. The main problem is time. The problem that clinical trials are considered to take a long time to get out. If we could do them quicker, we'd be fine with this kind of process happening. I tell you the reason why it takes such a long time is because the FDA, FDA takes a long time to ratify each trial, to get through each trial to make decisions about it. We think that it's very plausible that we could get around this problem by making the FDA, um, that's the people who sort of regulate drugs, do these type of things quicker and have expedient pro um, processes to get these things released. And also the moment that phase three trial starts working, they start seeing successes that they can monitor still maintaining the double blind status, we can release these medications with the hope and the knowledge that they will actually work on the people they need to go to. And secondly, the point I'm going to address is James' assertions that these type of people are very rational and therefore can make informed decisions about the risks that they take. These are people who are incredibly sick. They are paranoid because they've been isolated into cages, basically, that the government's put in them in, the government they mostly don't trust. Um, and they're not the type of people who anymore really have any rationality. They're very scared. We think they're likely to make decisions that they might regret later. If this type of medication has extreme side effects, if it results in them dying quicker, if it results in incredibly bad quality of life as they die, we think this could be a problem. And we think that therefore it's unwise for us to allow them to do it. We also think a lot of people don't understand the science that goes behind it. They think that there's something that works and they go to fight, but they don't actually know why or like if it will actually work for them. And finally, just this arbitrary point about um, Americans getting treatment. Like, we just hope that's a one sort and of doesn't happen again. We hope it's regulated, and we also think the FDA can pull strings to make sure that doesn't happen again. Cool. So, let's address the main crux, which is really the context in which Ebola lives. Ebola is like kind of a neglected disease. There's been a lot of, actually, quite a few outbreaks in the past, and in the past, they've been very well contained. The countries that they have happened in, like places like, I think, like Nigeria and stuff like that, they managed to control them just by doing contact tracing and simple measures like quarantine. Why is this kind of different? It's because in this case, the, pe the countries in which Ebola has stricken, I suppose, have made bad decisions, right? So um, these countries do not, do not have planning in place. They don't necessarily have the quarantine and plans in place for when the first Ebola cases arise in their country. And also, the problem is that the people in these countries, there's like political turmoil and whatnot, and like Liberia and stuff, people don't trust the government. When they put into quarantine areas, they break out, they try and go out into the city, and therefore they actually infect more people. Ebola is a specific disease in that it's like quite contagious, right? You get it from touching fluids, but it also kills fairly quickly. So it's unlikely to spread that far in terms of epidemiology if it's well controlled and your quarantine is set up properly. We also think that this is why this type of disease is unlikely to have as big a toll if you were to go to a Western country, if you were to go to South Africa, anywhere like that. It's unlikely to actually cause a problem. There's only been like 2,000 cases so far. It's actually not that big a disease in terms of things that countries should be focused on about. Why is this important? It's important because the pharmaceuticals that develop drugs are often in the West. And where there's a disease like Ebola that only affects a small amount of people from Africa, where there isn't a lot of money to pay for this disease, it's likely that only small pharmaceuticals will actually make these vaccines or like treatments. Why is that important? Well, for a small manufacturer to make a vaccine a product, basically, they want to maximize their profits out of all pharmaceuticals. But they can't do so if they're small and don't have a sort of capital to, to fall back on. They need to safeguard that the thing that they give up to people is going to work. And that if it doesn't work, they'll be sort of screwed and won't have anything to fall back on. So they need a safeguard. Um, so in this case, what happens? Um, so the pharmaceuticals can't make profit they're unlikely to want to go into this sort of avenue. We also think then if this happens, there's less incentive for future profit, profit testing of drugs um, and the general profit testing to happen for all other infective diseases, of which there's a lot more that focus on a lot larger groups of people. Um, for African governments, it's 
quite important because this type of thing would cost quite a lot to put in, especially untested. That's a risk that shouldn't be taken. When, because of the political turmoil in these countries, um, patients who are going to take these medications are likely to want to take them because they think they're going to save their lives. They're likely to want to break out of the places where they're, they're being kept. They're likely to want to spread, be able to spread this disease a lot quicker. That's the type of risk that we think African countries shouldn't be allowing their people to take. And when they don't have a lot of money to, to put into something like this, they need to guarantee that it's actually going to work and help their people. Um, yeah. So the last one's Kira for that. Um, and we now have the floor for questions. So if anybody has any questions, mm -hmm. I'd like to remind you that the questions yeah. are specifically designed so that uh, to ask them if, and if an answer would specifically sway you one way or another. So uh, people who have questions. Hmm. Anybody? Uh, okay, so um, I'll go over this way. So um, one of the problems that's happened with Ebola is people, the superstitions around some of the clinics, and that's made it a worse problem because people are avoiding those clinics. So in the case of untested drugs, and they specifically target this case, if you do get negative side effects, that's likely to undermine the efforts of people working within those communities because people will be superstitious and then if they contract the disease, they're unlikely to go to those medical centers. And that's problematic. So what I want to know is I want your specific context given that it takes place in rural areas where we don't have the same amount of information that would make these people necessary rational actors as you described. Okay, um, one of the problems that we face in like treating very preventable diseases in Africa is that a lot of the people in these rural areas have a perception that they want things like injections, they want super drugs. Like there's often cases where the child gets to be sick or has disease. In order to save their child's life, all the doctor needs to give the family is like a hydration pack, right? The problem is they try to administer these packs and those people end up not coming back to those clinics. They tend to just want to have the very flashy medication, the thing like the injection, the thing that kind of holds the pill properties for them. So in terms of this debate, the problem when you start allowing people to have the option of these super drugs or these especially untested drugs is that you might often get these people rather opting to go for those, the far more risky things that then have the problem with Julia raised as opposed to just going for standard treatment that might in fact be the best option for them at the time, or the safest option for them at the time. Okay, uh, okay I'm not gonna turn the camera to face myself, but um, I'm not a medical student, but I'd just like a little bit, so yeah, I'd just like a bit more context as to what potentially some of the repercussions could be if this is like a bad drug per se, and isn't tested, I think there's it's been kind of thin on the ground, just alluded to as far as that's concerned. Before I make any calls in this debate, I would like a bit more context as to like what risks we're foreseeably discussing here. Uh, if there's no another question, yeah. okay, I'll go around first. <laughs> okay, uh, just in terms of like the amount of cases of Ebola, I think there's been 2,000 deaths confirmed so far and 5,000 cases. And this morning, I think the FDA released that there's expected that there's been 20,000 cases so far that they haven't all been reported. And predictions are that by July, not July, sorry, by January, we could see up to a million people infected with Ebola. Um, yeah, so that's just reported by the FDA. And they, or well, I think it was the FDA, um, they recommend that obviously we need to do something about that to prevent that from happening because with a 50% mortality rate, that's 500,000 people dead if that happens, okay? Um, yeah, so how do you come up with drugs in a situation where a disease isn't common and you don't have subjects to test it? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, it's just that what, at what stage of the drug testing process, uh, process do you determine um, to cut it off and just release the drug? So what stage in testing do you propose to interrupt the normal process so that the drug can be dished up? The thing is that if you interrupt it at an early stage, you're in the zone where there's a whole bunch of drugs that cause a big chaos. Um, and even at later stages, certain drugs have had huge long-term health complications. So I'd like more specifics as to how you intend to interrupt the normal process and maybe some specific examples of what the actual drugs you're talking about are. 
All right, I'm going to close question after this uh, for now, and I'm going to invite James to answer the question. The line is that they are, most of them are to do with what the context is and why it's important that we're able to do it. So, under the, what seems to be the problem with that is that we might, what, we might encourage some kind of superstition around these, these drugs. So, not all drugs are 100% effective. Under your, like your guys' objection, it would be that any drug that doesn't work is likely to like, arouse superstition. The same is true of any drug. That is an argument for not giving drugs in general. It's not an argument for not giving like some drugs that may have like intermittent effectiveness to what you're trying to do. So if this drug saves like one life but like doesn't save all the others, well, if it's more effective than them all dying, we think it's worthwhile doing, right? And that's like where I want to possibly address here as well. Her suggestion is that those two Americans whose lives we save by giving this drug, we should you know crack down on them. You know, they should have like deserved to die in order to like uphold like the fundamentals of the system. We just think that's a part, right? We just don't think that it's ever legitimate to deprive people of the opportunity to make their lives better. It's never okay to like deprive someone of possibly life-saving medication. Even if you do save that one life, we think that's worthwhile. We think that's the choice any one of us would make if we were in that position. Over and above this though, so we've had some contests contestations about people like don't understand science. I don't understand the science of most of the drugs that I'm given, right? I just opt into possible risks based on like the suggestions of my attending physician. So yes, we might have a slight like, context where if people like uh, if there are better drugs available, we would force people to opt into those. But in a situation like that you know 60% mortality rate and that people just aren't going to like overwhelming possibilities that you aren't going to live. We're going to give you the best possible thing in order to do that, regardless of whether it's been done by a test. The degree to which we do it, the gentleman asks, like, where would we cut off? We would do it in proportion to how desperately these drugs are needed. So if nothing works, or well, we have this thing of very, very early testing, which does like a little bit of work, we would do it then. Obviously, if we have a drug that works, we're not going to like flood the market with things that don't work in order to fulfill a need that doesn't exist. That's not reasonable. We want to do something that's reasonable. We think saving people's lives by giving more effective drugs that haven't reached the stage of testing that we would uh, normally consider necessary, people should be able to opt into those. We think that's pretty, um, or should that rather be pretty uncontentious. The contention from Kira is that we should just like make the FDA better. Well, yes, that's fine. We support that too. We just think that the time like lag isn't going to be put down to zero. At any point where the time lag isn't zero, if you can't get drugs immediately, we favor people being able to opt into these risks where they seize them. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to do two things. First, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the risk to the individual. And then I'm going to talk about the main point that was sort of addressed to me, which is about what the possible problems with a treatment that doesn't work was an effective treatment. Um, okay, so I think like the final sort of finality problem in allowing people to take this much risk in medicine is that in the status quo, when there's a drug that starts getting really bad side effects, it causes you know, cardiac arrhythmias and just like one tiny percentage of people, it becomes a company's problem. It's their problem, they have to take it off the market and they have to make sure that it's safe for the people. It becomes their like responsibility because their reputation is at stake because of that. That's like one reason why people might like pharmaceuticals might not be interested in this sort of course. But it's also important because when we allow um, these sort of drugs to be released without being tested, we basically put that responsibility on individuals and we say that risk is entirely yours. We don't want the pharmaceutical to, to take it. And so that's a bad paradigm because it means the pharmaceutical either takes no responsibility for their risks or is too, too afraid to release these drugs because of that. It's in the best interest of everyone to know that it's safe. Um, then let's talk about dangers. And possibly the biggest danger in this type of um, situation is actually that this drug is completely ineffective and acts like at best as a placebo. <laughs> and then just quickly on genes, like we the way drugs get released is that they're normally like best, better than the best practice or better than placebo. Like that's kind of how we know they actually are effective. So there are ways to test this, and they're not hundred percent effective in anyone, but when you can see reduced deaths overall, then you know you're doing a good thing. If it's a placebo, you would notice that as we've already spoken about this context and people not trusting the governments, but trusting medication that's been alluded to by the audience as well, trusting any sort of drugs, especially like huge injections. Um, we think that people are going to opt out of healthcare systems, they're going to run away from them. They're going to very easily spread this disease much further if they are no longer allowing themselves at all to have contact with the current healthcare systems of quarantine. Especially given the scale that we've given, if 
then these people stop like attending quarantine based activities and so on, it could really go much further than just a million people. And we also think that when governments, African governments, no longer feel they need to invest in quarantines and start investing instead in these drugs, they reduce the mechanisms that we know do work eventually at current. And that could lead to very devastating effects. Finally, just we need to discuss like who would actually fund this type of mass out crime drug. So either it's African governments or it's like pharmaceuticals, very unlikely, they're not gonna do it if they want money, or it's like Western governments. We think, especially given this context, it's also more an incentive of these kind of Western governments to help people by supporting quarantine efforts, which they know work, and put their money and their risk into a treatment that also might be perfect. So for these reasons, the placebo drug is very much more likely to cause devastating effects and therefore the mission for large should not be tested. Okay, so we think it's quite interesting that cyber opposition today has characterized Ebola as not that big a problem. We think it's basically in keeping with the rest of their case that they haven't really considered things properly. So first of all, let's deal with some rebuttal where we're first, first of all gonna talk about like this weird paternalistic attitude. That first of all, people, if the drugs don't work, are just not going to buy into the healthcare system anymore. And second of all, that current systems that are in place like contact tracing and so on are not going to work in this case. First of all, what we say is, well, the current system is not working very well. People are going into hospital and then they're dying 60% of the time. We don't think they have all that much trust in the healthcare system as it is. And really, if we can give them an option that improves their outcomes, we're actually more likely to get buy into the healthcare system. Second of all, we'd say that, well, they're probably just not going to know if the drug's going to be effective or not, because the only people who are ultimately going to know whether or not it's the drug or Ebola that's killing the people is the people with statistics on a larger scale. We don't think it's gonna change any individual like idea about what the healthcare system is. But second of all, let's talk about like the effect this is gonna have on other things like contact tracing and so on. Well, we think these like systems can happen like in conjunction with um, any sort of like medical treatment. First of all, they're probably cheaper, so states are just more likely to buy into that. But second of all, we just don't think like when treatment becomes available, people's health behavior changes all that much that they become like really risk seeking. There's treatment available for AIDS, but not everyone's like, yeah, let me just go try and get AIDS. We're still going to like have people trying to reduce Ebola. But second of all, let's talk about, well, that deals with the issue of superstition. Now let's deal with pharmaceuticals. Well, what we see currently is that the only pharmaceuticals actually creating drugs are pharmaceuticals that really don't have very like monetary um, like motivations. They're actually quite altruistic in the sense in that Ebola is not that large a problem as far as monetary concern goes. What we say in response to like Kira's argument about pharmaceuticals not being benefited is first of all they'll benefit from like free testing. So they'll get to see if their efficacy actually works. And second of all we say that they'll get the benefit of government funding. The US government itself has said well we'll help out um, with funding Ebola treatment because we regard it as like a global problem. Now as far as my speech today goes, first of all I'm going to talk about the development cycle of drugs because I think this is quite an important thing to consider when we're talking about like letting untested drugs onto the market. So what is the process that drugs go through? Well first of all they go through safety testing. We give drugs to people who don't have any form of disease and then we say do these drugs have a negative side effect on these people? First of all, short term, and then longer term. Now, what we say is in the case of Ebola, these safety precautions and treatments required for them, like, just don't apply. Why is this? Well, first of all, Ebola is just a pretty bad illness. You have a 60% chance of dying from Ebola. There's not all that much chance that a drug is going to make those outcomes considerably worse. Second of all, we say in response to one of the questions that the type of drugs being tested are the type of drugs that aren't probably going to be all that harmful. Why is that? Well, first of all, Z ZMAP, for example, is very similar to a lot of drugs that we currently have. It's a monoclonal antibody, and we use that sort of thing for tests, for like treating rheumatoid arthritis. By changing like the like epitope or whatever of that treatment doesn't change it, or it's unlikely to make all that much harm, much more harmful. 
But second of all, we'd say that the side effects of these drugs that you really want to worry about are probably long-term side effects. Short-term side effects you can like see and then you can deal with. The thing about long-term side effects is that we think that when you're faced with a 60% mortality rate, you're not all that worried about them. If you develop cancer in 10 years' time, well, it's a hell of a lot better than dying tomorrow. Okay, that deals with the treatment cycle. And furthermore, as it goes, we already do this. So when you're faced with like a really big chance of dying from cancer, we allow people to use untested drugs on them and things like HIV because we acknowledge that the risk-benefit ratio and way up changes when you're faced with a life-threatening illness. But finally, let's talk about the benefits to the community as a whole because we think that um, as far as current interventions go, they're not particularly effective. Why is this? Well, current interventions rely on changing human behavior. They require people changing their cultural beliefs, like changing their funeral ideas and so on. This is a really difficult thing to do. What we see in, modern, in the modern world and in the world we live in is that the only real efficacious medical interventions are technological interventions. We need vaccines out, and the only way to get them out faster is by removing that unnecessary safety stage and getting drugs out and testing efficacy today. Thank you. In the 1980s, at the height of the HIV epidemic, Zygolhudine was released as the first antiretroviral. But specifically in response to widespread public pressure in order to release it at its infant stages of development, what happened was a rejection of the drug because it was ineffective, caused serious side effects, and even when it wasn't as catastrophic a case as Ebola, it created a mistrust around antiretrovirals that we think we can link to AIDS denialism within South Africa itself. Releasing untested drugs onto the market is particularly da dangerous for the perceived efficacy of the medical um, fraternity itself. We tell you on two points of response. Firstly, to their idea of choice. It's that they're encouraging an ill-informed choice among people, where rational decision-making is based on a reasonable appraisal of risk when it comes to taking the medication you want. We think what they do is they deceive people into making ill-informed decisions based on no risk calculation itself. We think that in and of itself is an illegitimate and irrational decision if you have no idea what the effects of your taking something is. And we think that's particularly pernicious when it's advocated for by a government to collectively delude these people who are particularly vulnerable in the context where they are faced with the th a th imminent threat to their life to make an ill-informed choice. Furthermore, we think that informed choice is the primary doctrine of medical care itself, to encourage people to make reasonable appraisals of risk itself. What they do is they deceive these people into making illegitimate choices, not really the type of characterization we received from James as a completely well-informed voluntary choice. But secondary, a lot of the time, these people are in a lot of pain. They are suffering from a hemorrhagic fever. They are bleeding from every orifice. And we think you further pressure them into making illegitimate choices under that context. A lot of the time, they're not even asked in emergency scenarios whether or not they would like this specific treatment. You characterize it as a rosy scenario of them being given the opportunity to opt in and opt out. Don't pretend that this, in an emergency scenario that this decision isn't going to be forced upon these victims at all choices, even, and we think, at base level, that doesn't do credit to the type of choice analysis that you created. It's a false choice, even if it is a choice. But we think that in that, that, that scenario, we think that this choice itself isn't particularly valuable if it's made with potential consequences to that person. Tim laughs off the idea of side effects, but having your last two weeks on Earth being racked by uh, extreme headaches with nausea and vomiting in addition to severe bleeding is particularly dangerous for these people. And the potential conse consequence, we think, debilitates that their last moments on Earth, potentially. And we think that even if that's a, that's a limited um, side effect profile, we think that's something that they should be able to make reasonable approximations to. And when we have adequate research behind those drugs, then we potentially have a better option for even physicians to impose this potential choice upon. The last thing they tell us is about the incentives behind the pharmaceutical company itself. Kira just told you that it shifts the burden of accountability onto the user itself. And we think that's a particularly dangerous precedent to set, is that when you take a drug that you're assuming on personal risk behind it, and that company can abdicate response or, or um, liability to the decision you've made. 
that's a particularly dangerous narrative to spread about drugs when people are generally ill-informed. And we don't want to create the perception that drugs in, in itself are a personal choice that a company providing for you has no stake in being held accountable for. The last thing we're going to tell you is looking at how this potentially destabilizes these incredibly weak countries. When we see the context in which there is poor regard for the government, endemic mistrust for Western ideologies and movements, especially when we see in Liberia people burning down clinics where Ebola is particularly rampant, where this fear of colonialism, of the failure of Western states to intervene to stop Ebola in the first place, and a poor response to the epidemic by government officials, you have a breeding ground for greater resentment in the context of uncertainty. It's where, if this drug is unlikely to work, unlikely to save as many lives as promised, you have rejection of the intervention itself, violence against these clinics. And second, opportunistic splinter groups like opposition movements or terrorist organizations. Boko Haram is rampant within Nigeria and the Muslim Brotherhood on the outskirts of Liberia. It's dangerous to create an unstable narrative that reflects poorly upon the government itself and that level of intervention. And lastly, it's that you threaten the foundation of the perception of Western medicine as a whole, an institution which is gaining some traction within these areas for proven effect and effectiveness. What you do with untested drugs that are unlikely to work is undermine that narrative and the setup for good and proper health care to be set up within those countries in the future. We tell you Ebola isn't a special case. We stick to the grounds of medical ethics test these drugs and allow people to make rational choices, allow governments to make rational choices, and promote health care as a whole. Right. Well, I to notion that the only people who are actually aware of the effectiveness of the drug itself and statisticians are the people who are dealing with the academic research behind this. I want to know what the stance is on whether or not um, the proposition believes that there is an obligation, legal or moral, to fully disclosing the effectiveness of the people who are actually Isn't as severe as 
spreading of Ebola, particularly when you have that, where you have the ability for those drugs to push down the viral content, not kill that virus in that in, in that circumstance, and then develop um, 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 vaccine uh, which resistant uh, vaccine resistant variant. Uh, okay, lastly, I'm just going to take the gentleman there on my right. Me on my your left. Yes. So. Yes. Okay, I've got a question just specifically for Yash on the kind of you're now going to destabilize and use a whole bunch of faith in the system currently. What I would just love with this point is like some sort of comparison to how that compares to the current system where you've got a vast amount of people who are dying and how groups if you want to characterize it in that way, like Boko Haram are likely going to be telling people, well look, you're dying currently anyway, the government still isn't capable of saving you. Why is that particularly worse when you give them these experimental drugs? Okay, thank you. I now invite the Secretary of the Proposition to answer the question. So I think that sort of three areas that I'm going to cover. The first is this idea of whether or not people are fully able to like make an autonomous or aware decision. The second thing is this um, basically argument to not treat people ever. I'll explain that in a bit. And then the third thing is this question, these questions regarding like the particular pharmaceuticals and the example. So I don't really want to get too much into the biology of this situation. But the thing is that, so <laughs> they're similar drugs in the sense that they act in a similar way, but they're by no means like capable of treating the same diseases. Um, antibodies like are generic things within your body, but they're able to tackle a whole lot of um, different diseases depending on like the variable epimeto on the molecule. So really, um, most of the like arguments around this, I just don't feel are all that like legitimate. So the question about whether or not pharmaceuticals will just be able to go and sort of attempt to farm off drugs, well, it's probably not going to be particularly likely because these drugs just aren't made for treating Ebola and it would not have any effect. But secondly, we think that the people who ultimately prescribe drugs are doctors, and the doctors are the ones who are aware of what and how a medication is supposed to work. But, okay, second of all, then, this argument about whether or not we should um, allow people to, first of all, be faced with drugs that aren't fully tested, so dose-related wise, and yeah, basically the argument to not treat people well. But what we say to this is that basically when a drug goes through its development cycle, it eventually goes through a, it goes through a phase where we're not sure if it works or not. It has to go through a randomized control trial phase where it's tested on people and where we see if it's e efficacious or not. According to opposition's argument, every time people are faced with a drug that, well, isn't efficacious, they just abandon medicine altogether. And additionally, we think that any dose-related things can be worked out in the process of skipping the safety phase and going straight onto ethics. Now, onto this idea that people aren't reasonably like, able to make an appraisal of risk. What we think the situation here is, is that they're not like, fully aware of what all the complications may be, but they are like aware that this drug is untested and that we're not fully aware of what the implications are. So you can still inform someone, and someone can still decide if they want to be risk averse or not. So they can decide if they want to go with the 60% chance of dying from Ebola, or they can decide to go with potentially more negative side effects. We often give people this choice, such as like when people are treated with chemotherapy for cancer. Like when people are faced with dire situations, it doesn't mean they're completely unable to make an autonomous decision. It just means that the decision is like one between two difficult choices. It doesn't mean that that choice isn't there in the first place. Thank you. So I'm going to respond to the idea of choice and then how we worsen and destabilize these countries. Firstly, to choice. I think I forgot to analyze how ZMAP works, right? So it's in, um, a monoclonal antibody that you transfer between people. That's particularly dangerous when we don't know what other epitopes this cross reacts with. The reason we don't just transplant antibodies between people willy-nilly is because of autoimmunity. And thank you for reminding me of that potentially dangerous consequence of that very mechanism. But we think that on short-term and long-term levels, that there are significant short-term harms to people 
more pain, being debilitated, being delirious, experiencing a far worse, potentially, last bit of your life. But even on the long term, if you suggest that 60 or 40% of people are going to survive, is that these people face really significant out the, um, significantly poorer outcomes of a future quality of life by be losing control of their limbs or becoming slightly demented. It's that there are undesirable consequences that we can't predict, even in the long term. Efficacy itself, even outside of the safety brackets, particularly works. In fact, you're making a trade-off of an opportunity cost of governments putting money into this, of buying these drugs on mass and distributing it to people, and an opportunity cost that we think is a real live cost in a limited cost scenario that we could divert to quarantine, to monitoring the, the illness itself or to developing a vaccine specifically, because we've seen vaccination and treatment options becoming competitors for funding, especially in the context of an HIV epidemic. Okay, yeah, to that point. So we think that under a spectrum of choice, that's dangerous. Specifically to how we destabilize the scenario, it's that it's not only that your government is incompetent, it's that your government is being bought out by Western pharmaceuticals who are benefiting specifically by this, and then are further failing. It's that you compound the perception of a failed government by an association, especially in a context of where there's rampant fear of neocolonialism and the effects that people have, um, that if foreign intervention ha is having on that state in the first place. And we're not suggesting that radically changes the landscape of incentives, but we think it's an augmenting, fa an augmenting factor that we'd rather not have in the way in which people can continue to demonize their governments. And we think that's particularly big. So what we've given you so far is that you like change the incentives of pharmaceutical companies, you expose people to a false choice. And, that, um, and Tiff tells us that you can have an awareness of uncertainty and that's enough to make a rational choice. No, you just have to have an awareness of the proportion of risk and that's something you don't even have in this case. You have to have it on the hearsay potentially of an untested drug. We think that even in those contexts that you can't simply, we don't want governments to gamble away people's lives on potential. So what we, we would suggest at this point is that we're imposing a false choice upon people where a drug is potentially unsafe, potentially ineffective, and we think this is a particularly dangerous thing to do on, in order to combat this epidemic. Okay, so the first thing that I want to talk about is I want to talk about pharmaceuticals, the kinds of incentives that they have in this context and then I'm going to talk about trust within the system, and I'm going to talk about individual rights loss. I think it's something very important that hasn't been focused on enough in this debate, because I think it's important to recognize that as every individual who has a voter, you want the best chance of fighting that disease according to you. And as that individual, when you're asking the doctor for a specific medication, when you're asking them to put in their best efforts to curing or treating you, it's important that you take into consideration what they want and their preferences and we think that, that is an important part of the rights that you um, have in terms of how you are treated. So firstly, talking about pharmaceuticals, and the first thing here that I want to say is that I think it's important to recognize the kind of moral obligation that I, that I think um, rests on the individuals who have the ability to make a difference in this case. Because obviously they're not going to release drugs that have a negative expected value. That just makes no sense. They don't want to damage their reputation by putting out drugs that just like kill everyone. They also don't want to put out they also don't want to put out drugs which like um, have horribly negative side effects that do damage the ability for doctors to trust and market that brand in the future. Pharmaceuticals care about their brand a lot. That's something that's empirically true when we look at how they try to market their brand all the time. But more than that, what we say is that because Ebola isn't a, a, a disease that affects a particularly huge number of people at the moment, it's one that isn't a particularly massive cost, specifically when you're cutting off the testing phase and decreasing the amount of time you spend testing. That's a cost for pharmaceuticals. If we get rid of some of that cost, that means that it's not something that has negative effects on them. It's something that they're incentivized to want to do if there's a positive expected value to um, putting that drug on the market. That means that on a balance of probabilities, it's probably going to make more people better than it's going to make worse off. That doesn't mean it's going to make everyone better. But we think when there's a positive expected value and you help some people, if your net calculus is positive, you absolutely ought to be, um, ought be um, investing in, in allowing that drug to get into the to get into a situation where people are asking for the drug, which is something important to recognize, specifically because um, while it's mutually beneficial, it makes uh, the costs less for pharmaceuticals, and it is gonna make 
some people better off. But specifically when like doctors are expected to be doing on average like mitigating as much harm as possible, we think that when there's a positive expected value, that's when you do this. If the drug is in the short run can to be incredibly harmful, then we would take it off the market because then obviously it's not going to be about something that people want. I mean, then in those cases, it's um, uh, like legitimate to handle it in that way. Um, cool. So then the next thing that I want to talk about is in terms of system and trust. And the first thing to recognize is at the moment, people don't trust the system. At the moment, people are breaking out and running away. And what we tell you is worse than this is the kind of narrative that's being perpetuated is one that says Western doctors aren't helping us. They are leaving us and abandoning us. There hasn't been a good response from the rest of the world. Pretty much no one's helped except for America, and they're helping in um, they're helping a lot in um, Liberia, but not very much in any of the other countries which are affected by Ebola. That has tangible consequences for the people on the ground, trusting Western medicine, trusting med Western powers, and the ability for them to opt into, uh, and the likelihood of them opting into the, um, uh, the medical structures that exist. They're far more likely to want to keep coming back to clinics to get treated if there are fancy drugs that are being offered to them. If they aren't being offered drugs and all they're being told is we'll quarantine you until you die, then yes, they're going to panic. Yes, they're going to run away and they're probably going to try to maximize the quality of life they have for the last bit of their life. But what's important to recognize there is that's because that's the way that they're making, given that they don't think that there's any prospect for getting better and they don't think that there's anyone who's invested in making sure that they do get better, given that they believe that people do have the ability to make them better and aren't choosing to release that ability to them. We think that's incredibly problematic and it definitely increases the narrative of, of riots and panics that exists at the moment. Specifically when we see at the moment people looting places and people um, uh, people not feeling comfortable to disclose the fact they have Ebola. They are far more likely to feel willing to disclose this fact if they believe there is a drug out there that can treat them. That means that if we release the drug, we're probably more able to incentivize people to come and opt into our systems and far more likely to have them tr um, uh, trying to get treated if they believe there is a treatment for them to take. So now in terms of containment, and here what's very important to recognize is that on both sides, there is there are side effects. In the long run, the side effects of allowing Ebola to run rampant and not releasing drugs that have a positive expected value in terms of treatment in the long run is the destruction of an economy. It's the destruction of any kind of traveling in and out of your country. It's the destruction and destabilization of your government because masses and masses of people have died. A whole bunch of your infrastructure is damaged by people, by people rioting and by people not being willing to buy into that infrastructure. So then, um, finally, in terms of individual rights, if you ask for certain treatment from your doctor and if you are dying, you are entitled to fight for your life right up until the dying breath, even if it is in a way that it results in negative costs being imposed on you. We don't think that's a coerced choice. We think that's an entirely legitimate choice, incredibly congruent with human nature, that you want to do everything within your power to fight, to continue to exist and continue to live. And we think that that is something that we should allow people to do. Okay. So proposition this thus far has basically said, let's use them as guinea pigs, even if they want it, okay? And the problem with this, we will address as my speech continues. First of all, let's, let's um, look at incentivizing pharmaceuticals, okay? That, that's what's been brought up later. Um, we've looked at um, whether or not pharmaceutical, incentivizing pharmaceutical companies is going to help at all in this situation. Now, first of all, we have to look at what the cost is. So if you're looking at cost versus benefit here, and does Western medicine have an interest at all in a West African disease, okay? So the fact that you can't use a free market sort of absolutist view when, you are, when you're trying to incentivize the West to invest in a West African illness that, that will in all, in all probability never even reach um, America or Canada, etc. So, um, looking at whether or not people will, people will um, come to, to get treatment if they are able to, um, if there's an incentive, you, you have to be able to say at, at what cost are, um, are we allowing these companies to come into a country and um, make it and, and basically just take whatever they want, let any drugs um, be tested, I mean, be, be implemented. Okay, so um, let's, let's look at what the risks are in terms of allowing all of the, allowing untested drugs onto the market in the first place. 
um, our, our case thus far has been that you're, you're creating an uncertain precedent, or you're creating a precedent that flies in the face of the basic fun foundations of evidence-based medicine. Um, and this precedent we have, we have shown is dangerous because um, you are you're taking away regulation, first of all. You're taking away um, the fact that we test medicines before they are, before they are put on the market because <laughs> medicines are, in fact, dangerous. Drugs are not without their problems. And for this reason, um, we looked at informed consent and whether or not um, allowing a patient to make a decision to, to uh, take an untested drug is based on a, a reasonable amount of information and whether or not they are able to take the, take the risk based on a, a full knowledge of the proportion of risk that is necessary or the, the, yeah, the knowledge of the proportion of the risk that is necessary to be able to make a informed decision in the first place. So in the case of Ebola and with ZMAP in particular, no one really has the information necessary to make the decision. You, can, you can't weigh up a, a, a decision that is potentially life or death based on, um, based on information about, about the disease itself, the 60% mortality, versus a total uncertainty of what may or may not happen. That brings me to my next point. There is no minimizing of side effects. They cannot be um, minimized. Adverse effects in, in the medical fraternity mean death in many, many cases. In the case of HIV-associated nephropathy, um, you get, or, or even just nephropathy uh, toxicity. And the classic example is thalidomide. Um, in, the, in that case, we basically, I mean, we tested on animals, we tested on 15 different species of, of primates, um, and then we let it go, and, the, and eventually, in 1962, um, we found out that, hey, it actually causes social media, and people really are born without on. So, um, that sort of risk, then, risk um, is not something that we allow people to take on an individual basis because the state has an interest in the well-being of all of its citizens. And if, if any of these, if all of these citizens are just allowed willy nilly to decide um, on whether or not they want to take drug X to cure their arrhythmias, then, um, then if, if some side effect eventually becomes known, um, as is the case with some tricyclics, so we only discover the side effects that affect maybe a, a smaller proportion of the population than others, um, we discovered them 20 years later, and in the meantime, you know, people are going to be experiencing these things without our knowledge. Then, on the issue of scale, the fact that, um, that so many people may be dying from this disease is even more, um, more incentive for us to be testing and for, for us to be guarding against um, potential adverse effects or potential um, risks associated with taking, with taking the drug. Then onto international relations, the fact that that taking um, that allowing untested drugs um, onto the market may have extreme effects eventually um, takes on an international relations problem scale because if the drug does not work, you are faced with a, an us versus them problem. You're faced with the fact that Liberia has an essentially American government and if the government does not work, um, yeah, so thank you for that. Now, uh, questions. Okay, so my question relates to, so earlier in this debate we had discussion about how pharmaceutical companies almost abdicate themselves from guilt in this instance. I'd like some analysis as to what happens further down the line in the long term if this person is necessarily cured of Ebola, if lots of people are cured of this, and then some like really problematic side effects begin to sort of, sort of emerge. The fact that these people are primarily from quite poverty-stricken third world countries and have very limited legal capital, how can they hold pharmaceutical um, companies to account on this level as well if now they like have really, really problematic side effects and can't even sue the pharmaceutical companies because they're from a poor third world nation. I think that's a harm that's kind of not been analyzed yet. Um, to some extent, I think it's problematic that a pharmaceutical company is choice and agency. And in that regard, why don't you just give them morphine? What we'd say is there's certain choices that don't respond to more agency. And what, in that regard, it's about the meaningful choices you give people. 
And in this regard, what we say is these choices are mutually objectified. They exploit people in desperate circumstances to give a tangible potential benefit to a broader society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A very important aspect of this, and that is that if it's a 60 percent mortality rate and the drug is no effect, more effective than a placebo, then what can happen in a scenario where everyone's running away from clinics because they're not getting treatment that's working is that if you suddenly say you've got a drug here that could help, then people come back to their clinics to get that drug. And because it has a 60 percent uh, mortality rate, it's is it only a slightly less than half, um, a slightly less than 50 percent chance that they will recover. If they recover, they come here, they've got this new drug, then they will likely attribute that recovery to the drug, not, really, not taking into account the fact that it has a 60% mortality rate. So what that means is that then you have those people then telling everyone else that this drug really works, and you get more people fighting for clinics. And then you can have a huge, the opposite problem that we have right now. Um, and also the 60% the mortality, um, it also means that 40% of people would uh, recover in whatever happens. And so that means the side question of side effects is a huge issue because only if you're getting 40% of people are recovering from this illness no matter what. If you've got side effects in those drugs, you, you can have a very significant impact on people's lives. in these conditions in Africa, um, and what are the risks, and are we willing to take on the risks of having a drug-resistant strain of a boat in the bed? Great, okay, thank you. Uh... Okay, so um, starting with the idea of um, drug resistance, I think it's important to recognize that like, a lot of people are like, oh, this is happening in Africa, therefore things are different, therefore they might, you, they might be like, drug-resistant development, people don't come back, all those sort of things. That's just an argument against giving people in Africa drugs, and that's not something we see happening. And so the reality of the context is, is that, yes, we're working with reduced infrastructure. Yes, we're working with people who don't trust the health system as much. But the worst thing we can do there is give them less agency than the kind of people that in Western context we do allow to opt into clinical trials. I think it's absolutely absurd that the most arguments that are being made by this side are effectively to say, no, we shouldn't allow people to opt into clinical trials when the results are unknown and there may be side effects. We allow that people to do that all the time. At the point at which we start test 
obesity rather than humans after it's only been placed as an, on animals, which is the case with, the, with some of the drugs that we're talking about in this debate, that it is the risk that people are allowed to take on. And we think that it definitely should be allowed to happen in African context as much as it should be allowed to happen in Western context, especially given that we're working with reduced capacity to treat people. And the statistics say that on an individual basis, your probability is a positive value of getting better. That's a massive, tangible benefit. So yes, maybe your quality of life is going to be reduced, but you're going to be alive. And that's a way of, that I can't make for every individual in those situations. But absolutely, we should give them the ability to make that decision for themselves, rather than us in a superior situation where we have better access to infrastructure. We're like, oh, well, poor them. They don't have the access to infrastructure that we do. So obviously, they can't have high risk. Um, drugs given to them. We should definitely give them the agency to make decisions about their lives, specifically when they're dying and specifically when they don't trust the healthcare system that they um, are, are given and specifically when it's largely a consequence of the colonial damage to the infrastructure that has accrued. We are partly responsible for the context in which they find themselves. We can help make it better and we can help by giving them drugs that have the potential to help them and respecting their ability to make decisions about their medical welfare. More than that, the concerns about precedent setting like ba bad medical practice just don't, don't um, account for the fact that this is a World Health Organization declared crisis. That means it's not something that happens all the time. It's not something that we're going to see happening like over and over again that people are slack and lazy about this. We think it's something that's going to happen in extreme cases where, pe where we don't have any other mechanisms to help. And specifically, that's what's important to recognize here is when we are dealing with reduced ability to make a difference, we should do whatever we can given that it does have the potential to make more of a difference than the mechanisms we see working at the moment. So yes, they may regret the choice that they make. That's the same thing that we allow people to do when we allow them to drink alcohol, when we allow them to smoke, when we allow them to have gender reassignment surgery. And what we do is we have doctors and healthcare professionals willing to be invested in those individuals and help them make the best decision. That should definitely be the case for these individuals who are suffering from Ebola. People are far more likely to be invested in them if they feel like they can help make them better as well. We think that it's more likely that you're going to get doctors invested in a situation where they feel safer from their patients because they're drugs that they have potential to use as well. An important dynamic to recognize in this debate. So what we tell you on site opposition is that we'd counsel these people, we'd allow them to be informed, and yes, there's risk. We can inform them of the risk and they can understand the way of their name. We can counsel them about the kinds of drugs that they speak about. The, um, the, the, that drug that had like the negative consequences on people who are having um, on on people when they had children. We can use that as an example and tell these people that the way that they're making is that they may, might may well fall into the forty percent who do get better. And if they take this drug, that they may have side effects that they wouldn't otherwise have. But on the other hand, they may be one of the people who are dying, and that um and that this drug could make them better and still give them side effects. That's the kind of counseling and decision that we can allow them to make. And we think it's legitimate to allow them to make it in a context where, firstly, there's explicitly been a, a context where people are asking for this. Secondly, when it's something that we allow to happen in other contexts, specifically where we've seen it being allowed to happen in Western contexts. But most importantly, when we need to do whatever we can and drugs do have the potential to help minimize this and minimize the impact that goes beyond the individual suffering and decrease contamination in the future and decrease the complete destruction of the economies and infrastructure within those environments. There's a predicted decrease of 4.9% economic growth in Liberia for the coming year. That's the kind of tangible harm that changes whether or not you can eat in the next year. That's a side effect that needs to be engaged with if we don't stop the Ebola crisis. First of all, the fact that the WHO has declared this a crisis is extremely arbitrary. That's based purely on the fact that two Americans got the disease in the first place. So, um, <laughs> literally in two weeks, they flipped from this is not a crisis to now we need to do something because Ken Grant has got the disease. Okay, so um, we have to look at the fact that in contextually, um, West Africa has paternalistic um, sort of medical systems in general and even government systems. And for that reason, um, most of these people are more likely, for instance, like Kira said earlier, to go for a, a large injection with a large more needle than take a pill because they believe that to be more effective. So there's lots of superstition, there's lots of pill-informed decision-making in general, and the, the context in which they are making these decisions is one in which a person who looks more informed than you do is, is, is allowed to make the decision for you. 
Now, that opens up these people to exploitation on a grand scale. And what we are saying here is that opening up and deregulating the system and allowing untested um, um, medications onto the market for whatever reason, for whatever incentive, is eventually going to have as, as the loser only the people at the bottom. And those are the people who know the least and who unfortunately also make up the majority of the population of the world. So you take away the so you take away regulation. You take away you give the companies who are in the West incentive to to make um, drugs based on you know the scale of diseases that are occurring. And um, basically you open up the the grassroots uh, folks, Joseph, to exploitation. Um, and that we cannot stomach, um, especially on a societal level. The fact that we are taking away, um, or that, we're tr that you, you sort of create a false equivalency between um, people in the West opting into clinical trials or drinking alcohol or, or taking any other sort of drug um, with the rationality of the people who are in this West African situation. Um, is eventually, I mean, it's a possibility, but that's not really what I wanted to say. Um, the fact is, you can't, um, the, the differences in, that, in rationality, the differences in the amount of information that is available to either of these parties um, are enough to disqualify the person who is making a life or death decision um, based on a 60% mortality rate um, versus unknown consequences for the future. Um, and, and those better informed people in Western countries with much better support and way more information available to them. Um, those are extremely different decisions and should be taken as such. Um, and finally, um, adverse effects, once again, it's not, it's, they, they really aren't to be minimized, and I speak as a medic here. The fact is, you, you are, I mean, without dialysis, you would die from You, you know, liver failure is real if you don't get a liver <laughs> transplant. Yeah. So um, the adverse effects that are, in fact, um, likely if if certain, if uh, these medicines aren't tested, um, on are definitely uh, serious, and they are to be. They should be taken as as seriously as a as a sixty percent chance of death. Um, And then, you know, like I said earlier, the international relations kind of, kind of things, as well as the fact that there is inherent mistrust of the government in lots of these situations. Um, and especially in Liberia, for instance, the, the government itself, the governments themselves, are not seen as a trusted entity, and therefore what they, what they say, and if, the, you know, if things were to go wrong, if these medicines were, do turn out to be placebos, or if they um, induce adverse effects that are are irrecoverable, then you destabilize the region, and these regions are already, in fact, not very stable to begin with. So the risks just far outweigh the benefits.